Right. Okay. So, so welcome everyone. Welcome to, um, well, what was originally going to be called, well, we can still call it that way, the first annual Jean Monnet Chair uh, Roundtable Debating European um, Security. Uh, of course, the original idea was to organize that meeting um, on campus, um, but rather than kind of canceling this meeting altogether, uh, we've decided that you know we may as well use Microsoft Teams and, and kind of run a maybe light version of that original idea. Uh, the idea was to essentially have a roundtable on the important issues related to European security. Um, and invite uh, speakers from other institutions to uh, to join and kind of share their expertise. Um, so today um, uh, we 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 have two speakers. Well, we have one speaker for now, uh, Christian Countert from the University of South Wales, and uh, we'll have another speaker from the same university. Um, and uh, this this event uh, is supported by the European Union's uh, Erasmus Plus uh, program. Um, so I will now maybe speak for 10 up to 15 minutes. I will share some kind of initial thoughts with you. Um, unsurprisingly, they will be related to coronavirus and 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 how it kind of shapes or reshapes kind of European security. Initially, I had. You know, my idea was to have it a kind of as 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 a kind of multi-topic kind of roundtable. But um, admittedly, some of the other issues that I was kind of originally originally planning to discuss, they they don't seem that maybe relevant at the moment. And maybe you will find it more interesting to uh, to get some kind of insights um, on 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 topics related to COVID nineteen. At least on my part, and 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 the other speakers are welcome to. To share whatever um, uh, insights and 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 kind of ideas th they have. Um, so after we have those initial kind of talks, you are welcome to to ask questions. Um, so so considering that this um, that this event is directed at students, um, students is our kind of target audience for that event. What I want to do um, briefly is to maybe offer you some some thoughts on how you could theorize this 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 coronavirus pandemic in the context of international relations and international security if you want to work with what's happening right now in the world if you want to work with that with that empirical kind of phenomenon if you want to integrate it into your kind of coursework essays dissertations in some way i i want to share some insights which may hopefully help you to achieve that objective but you know if you're not that's that's still okay hopefully you will kind of find some of that um uh, still interesting and uh and relevant so if you kind of you know if if you have taken you know some some of my my modules you you will know that um my idea um my favorite my preferred idea of kind of thinking about um about uh, theorizing things about kind of thinking about empirical phenomena in a kind of more theoretical way is to ask of what is this an instance right anything we see in the world anything that happens we can always ask of what is this an instance right what does it represent how can we conceptualize it how how can we discuss it in more abstract terms? And and coronavirus is no no different. Um, so we can ask um, of what is a COVID nineteen uh, an instance, right? Of what is this an instance? And one one answer can be that this is an instance of a health security problem, right? So we can theorize it as a health security issue. Um, so if if that's something that interests you, if that's if that's the kind of um, that's the angle that you find interesting and you would like to pursue it in your own work, then of course you know you 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 have to engage with this notion of health security. What is this idea of health security, and can can kind of global pandemic be a security issue? How how could it be a security issue? 
Um, and and if that's something that is interesting to you, then you 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 know you 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 have to engage with some of the key concepts that are then relevant uh, to you. And one of them is securitization. The other one could be even militarization. Um, there could be a concept of human security that you want to integrate uh, into your work. Um, so here is what I mean. Um, if you want to discuss COVID-19 in terms of um, in terms of health security, one one of the ways to do that is through the lens of this idea of human security. And if that is an angle that is interesting to you, you uh, you may want to then refer to the UN Development Program, um, so-called Human Development Report. You can easily find it. Just just Google Human Development Report from 1994, which kind of introduces in a kind of comprehensive way this notion of human security, what it means, what it entails. And that can be your starting point to then build on that and, and apply that, that idea to COVID-19. Uh, another concept that you may want to work with is securitization, right? Um, is the discourse of kind of national, international security uh, evoked here? Is it applied to COVID-19, right? Um, how do political leaders speak about this? Is it a national security issue, right? Who is who is uh, kind of um, invoking this this language of of security? Um, it can be you can you, in that case I would say you can easily apply the concept of militarization as well, right? Militarization, um, the use of military planners, personnel, and equipment to combat COVID. 19 the involvement of nato the involvement of um russian uh, military personnel right there is this um reuters um uh, report on the on the russian military involvement in italy right and it says russia has sent doctors nurses and medical equipment to disease stricken italy in a goodwill operation that moscow dubbed from russia with love why the Italian government has warmly, warmly thanked Russia, La Stampa, one of the country's oldest newspapers, has questioned the help. In one article, it quoted anonymous political sources as saying 80% of the equipment was little of no use. It also suggested that activity could lead to a security breach because of the large number of military involved, right? So, so it, it's kind of, it gives you an interesting angle on, 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 the seemingly health kind of um, health issue, right? Global health uh, issue. It gives you an interesting um, geopolitical kind of angle on that. And speaking about geopolitics, that's 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 another angle you can take. So one is one angle you can take um, is um, is health security, right? Is health security. The other one, the other question you can ask. Okay, so China and the United States are kind of kind of playing particular roles, right? They, beha they behave in certain ways, so the same the European Union and Russia, as we just mentioned. So of what is that an instance, right? You can also try and theorize that kind of broader geopolitical um, uh, kind of development that's, that's happening related to COVID-19. Of what is that an instance? So there may be different answers to, the, to this. One, one answer could be that what we see is this kind of, reformulation or, or or the reforming the changing nature of the global distribution of power and what i would suggest is that specifically what we can observe here is the global distribution of soft power right um so so china specifically has been um criticized and quite rightly for very kind of secretive very um, a very kind of delayed response to initial reports of this pandemic. But things changed at a certain point. And specifically, they seem to have changed on January 20th, when President Xi Jinping um, offered his kind of, um, his very harsh interpretation of, of how uh, from now on China is going to kind of respond uh, very actively and is going to lead efforts to combat COVID-19. And, and he specifically urged uh, for the timely release of information. And interestingly, 
and somehow unsurprisingly China's Communist Party kind of responded very promptly uh, with its kind of very, <laughs> very peculiar kind of, but again, unsurprising kind of language saying anyone who deliberately delays and hides the reporting of cases out of self-interest will be nailed on a pillar of shame for eternity, right? So that's that's China's Communist Party, kind of in a very peculiar way, calling on Chinese regions, Chinese regions governors to disclose all cases of COVID-19 and to be transparent, right? Directly responding to this criticism of, of, of a very kind of very strong mismanagement in the initial stages. And then in March, China kind of, um, goes on this kind of very international offensive, charm offensive, we could say, right? Foreign Minister of China in March declares um, that China pursues the kind of active diplomacy and international cooperation. They follow people-centered approach. Uh, they reach out to the world to communicate China's extraordinary response. Uh, China demonstrates its sense of responsibility by curbing the glo global spread of the, of the virus. And China sets a high standard for improving global public health governance, right? So the, 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 combined with that statement, there are videos, there are images of Chinese uh, medical professionals coming to different countries, uh, as well as um, equipment, right? Um, countries like Italy, Greece, Serbia, Africa, African continent, uh, receiving tons of equipment from China, right? And we have seen all, all, all those kind of pictures, images. Um, on top of this fact, on, on top of this, um, this idea that China now not only kind of contained um, the spread of the virus inside China, but it also now leads an international effort by, by offering a, a lot of help and assistance. On top of that, we also have to recognize the fact that China actually produces most of what the world um, needs right now. And um, to that end, in foreign affairs, there was this um, interesting article um, how the coronavirus could reshape global order. Uh, so the argument there was that China was already the major producer of surgical masks. Now, through wartime like industrial mobilization, it has boosted production of masks more than tenfold, giving it the capacity to provide them to the world. China also produces roughly half of the N95 respirators critical for protecting health workers, giving it another foreign policy tool in the form of medical equipment. Meanwhile, antibiotics are critical for addressing emerg emergency secondary infections from COVID-19, and China produces the vast majority of active pharmaceutical ingredients necessary to make them, right? So... So this so this this is interesting and the kind of Chinese response is especially interested in the context of the American um, and and European response or at least perceived um, a response from the United States and the EU. So the United States of course has been um, turning inwards, right? Closing borders, kind of focusing on self-help, America first, uh, fighting to get the vaccines for, uh, for Americans first, kind of Donald Trump has been very blunt about his his kind of um, approach uh, to COVID-19, um, which which can be kind of labeled as anything but kind of multilateral. Uh, the EU was perhaps a little bit slow kind of initially, but uh, it seems to be kind of catching up. It seems to be developing joint projects and and there are there are uh, initiatives uh, by individual member states. Germany in particular has been kind of actively uh, receiving patients from Italy. Um, and, and there is a number of other kind of initiatives, but kind of perceptions matters, perceptions matters. And, and so if we talk about this kind of changing distribution of global soft power, um, you know, it, if, the, if that's an angle that is, that is interesting to you, you may like to uh, revisit uh, social constructivism and how norms um, spread, how they develop, um, um, how perceptions matters in international relations, right? So, um, so that, so that's, so, so those are kind of two angles that I wanted to highlight here, here in this kind of short introduction. You may, 
you may look at the problem from the kind of health security perspective or the kind of broader geopolitical perspective and and how this kind of global um, distribution of soft power is kind of uh, changing and evolving, right? It's 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 by no means a closed chapter, right? Um, it, it's it it it's not certain at all that that China will succeed at establishing its image as this kind of uh, global leader on on fighting uh, COVID nineteen and. And there seems to be some some kind of pushback at the moment in Europe, kind of against this initial Chinese charm offensive. So, so it's not certain at all. But but I think those are two kind of angles that you know that you could uh, that you could explore. Um, so I think I will kind of I will stop here, um, and I will invite uh, Christian. Um, to kind of share his thoughts either on kind of COVID-19 or anything else. This is a, a, a roundtable on European security. I just thought it would be kind of relevant to maybe begin on that topic. Uh, Christian, if you would like to briefly introduce yourself and then 10-15 minutes for, for your initial thoughts. Right, well, hi Camille. Thank you very much for having me here. It's a great pleasure. I would have prefer to be there in person, obviously, that would have been nice. We could have had a personal chat, maybe shared a coffee together or something. So hopefully um, this will be happening next year. So hopefully by then we'll be all able to to sit together again, have those discussions in person. So I'd be very much in, in favor of that. So, but, but thank you very much for the invitation anyway. It's a great pleasure and honor to be there. Um, I wanted to share my thoughts. I'll start a little bit broader in terms of security and then I work my way into Europe and I work my way into the COVID-19 crisis towards the end. So I'll do it with the inverse pyramid. Um, I think certainly for those of you who might have come across some of my writing, um, you'll probably not be too surprised that a lot of it is in relation to the Copenhagen School, the kind of critical security studies agenda, if you like. So because I think one of the first things that we need to be discussing in a way is how extraordinary it is that nowadays we are talking about health security as if it is the most natural thing in the world. And in fact, it's not so long ago that even the, the, the very idea that there's a security dimension attached to health would have already had most people in horror kind of thinking, what is this? Why are they saying this kind of lofty stuff that cannot possibly be true. Um, certainly, if we go back, you know, early, uh, early or late 80s, I mean, this was nowhere near on the agenda at all. Uh, many issues that, in fact, I'm researching were not on the security, uh, on the security agenda, but clearly health was probably as far away from that agenda as you can possibly think. Um, now, in theoretical terms, we got quite much, much closer to it, thanks to the work of the Copenhagen School. But one of the things that I wanted to mention before I go into the theoretical is how interesting it is that we are talking about how this has been an expansion of how we see security on the academic agenda. But in fact, it's on the practitioner's agenda it has been. And again, this health security is clearly something that has been on the practitioners agenda, the, 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 the academic journal intelligence and national security, in fact, um, just published a special issue on intelligence and health security. So they kind of looked at how the various countries all around the world have been doing intelligence in the area of health security for a good number of years. And in fact, just um, a couple of days ago, I came across um, an article in the German uh, newspaper in the German magazine Der Spiegel where it was reported that, in fact, the German intelligence service, the BND, has evidence that supposedly China intervened at the level of the WHO in order to delay some of the responses of the WHO, which might have cost us something between two and four weeks uh, in, in response time. Um, the interesting bit here, and that I'm not going to discuss necessarily, unless you want me to, um, whether I think that China was in fact uh, causing this problem or not, but the interesting thing here is that we had an intelligence service that is clearly monitoring the private debates, the private phone calls of the WHO. And certainly um, this 
should only surprise you if you have a clear idea that health security is not a security related threat. But of course, the fact that various intelligence services consider it as such clearly tells you that the, the, the practice is quite widespread, that this is in fact happening. But let's go back to the theory, just one step back. And that is just slightly to the beginning, because of course, a lot of what we're doing nowadays, what we're analyzing and health security is, is one of those issues, has or, or owes a lot of um, credit in a sense to people such as Barry Buzan and Ole Weaver. Barry Buzan in um, the 80s and 90s, he developed um, his framework, uh, People, States and Fear, where he was talking about the widening of the security agenda, where he developed the five sectors, where mostly in the past people have been talking about military security, but he also developed the notion that there's something like political, also economic, societal and environmental security. I mean, some you can argue a little bit about whether those are the best five sectors that one can come up with. In fact, I have my own ideas about what you might improve here. But I think what is important here is this idea that there is more to it than just military security. And, and this was just a sort of, sort of an effort to kind of put some label on this. Also, this idea that, in fact, we have security dynamics at various levels, whether at the sub-state level, at the state level, or the international system. Again, most people that have been researching this would have been researching it from the point of view that, well, it's only really the states that matter, and as such, looking at any other kind of level doesn't really matter. So again, sensitizing us to the idea that security happens at a variety of different levels, not just at the state level. Obviously, then there's been further work and that kind of led also into my work in terms of migration and the, the securitization of migration. The idea here is that in the Copenhagen, Copenhagen School, securitization is how an issue transforms from a normal policy issue into what is perceived to be a security issue, meaning that you can use extraordinary means in order to be able to deal with it in a way kind of prioritizing the issue in order to be dealt with. It's about the construction of a threat, an existential threat, and there it kind of lends itself to some of the uh, realist ideas that kind of influence it. And the idea about survival, it, it brings a sense of importance to, to the theoretical debate and a sense of urgency. It also therefore legitimizes the use of certain special measures. And that's the objective, if you like, in terms of calling something security, is about legitimizing the use of certain special measures. The way in which this is done is that you have certain conditions. You have a securitizing actor who needs to have a certain authority that in a sense speaks the grammar of security, the kind of way in which it's linguistically constructed. There are certain characteristics of a particularly a particular alleged threat and there is of course the need for an acceptance of a particular audience. Now all of these aspects of the framework have been criticized in the academic literature in various forms and so on. Very often then linked to this is also the, the aim of desecuritizing this. Now in my own recent work um, we published a book with Professor Sarah Leonard last year on refugee security in the European Union, where we took the notion that in a sense refugees had been securitized and kind of investigated it because it had been thrown around a lot in the literature before, but really what it hadn't been done was it was essentially shown that this has actually happened primarily in the European Union and, and by the EU institutions. And in fact, most of our initial work showed very clearly that it hadn't actually happened until 2015. We didn't have a construction of refugees as a security issue by EU institutions, despite what the academic literature may or may not have said, because they didn't prove so conclusively. But what we did have from 2015 onwards is an indirect construction of uh, refugees as a security issue very strongly by linking the matter by association. I mean, one of the concepts that we used is this kind of idea of securitizing an issue by association. So you don't necessarily have to call a refugee a security threat. The way in which this is done is that when you associate refugees, let's say with terrorism, you're already securitizing the issue. Why? Because everybody knows terrorists are a security threat. This is an issue that has widely been accepted as a security threat. So by linking the two, 
obviously therefore migrants or refugees in this particular case also become a security threat. So what we look at there is that we see the crisis as it happens. We see the various corners from where the issue is starting to be securitized, primarily by associating it with, uh, with terrorism and um, looking at sometimes very rudimentary kind of simple evidence. And in fact, some of the terrorist attacks, let's say in, in, in Paris or in Berlin, did have an element of uh, refugees linked to that in the sense that the person, for instance, who committed a terror attack on Berlin was a rejected asylum seeker. So he wasn't an actual refugee, but he was a rejected asylum seeker who wouldn't have been expelled from the country. Yet. And by using those kind of uh, soft links, if you like, by associating the, the, the one policy issue like refugees with the other policy issues, terrorism, it ha was in fact uh, constructed as a security issue. Now, working on from that, we were in fact then working on the role of external actors in that securitization. At the moment, we're, we're finishing an article on the role of Turkey in particular, in the securitization of refugees in the European Union. I mean, the idea is very simple. If we look at the framework in securitization terms, um, it doesn't really open avenues for external actors. The securitization as it happens in the theory is all about people internal to the system. It's about a securitizing actor who's internal. It's about the audience that is internal. It's about all of the elements in the framework are all internal. But in the real world, in international politics, we know that not everything is internal. Some of it is external, right? And certainly the, the idea that we had here with Turkey is that we have an observer that is outside the European Union, but in a very close relationship with the European Union, very close relationship with the European Union. And this particularly close relationship with the European Union allows this kind of external observer to be very, very aware of the EU's vulnerabilities. Very clearly, Turkey has been aware that the EU had increasing amount of fear in terms of terrorist attacks, that there was a massive political crisis linked to, to the asylum crisis. And of course, that linked to this, the way that refugees had been securitized, in a sense, provided an opportunity. And here, this opportunity was such that it provided an opportunity for what some people might call blackmailing. Um, in the article, we make the distinction between blackmailing and what is, in fact, legally speaking, extortion. Because if we look at, uh, at the actual definitions of what blackmailing is, what Turkey was doing is not blackmailing, because blackmailing is all about revealing information that nobody knows. But of course, Turkey was not threatening to reveal information about the EU that nobody knows. Everybody knows that uh, refugees have been securitized in the European Union, including Turkey. So it didn't have to it didn't have to reveal anything, but it's about extortion, about coercion, about doing something that the EU perceives as harm, which is to open the floodgates. Erdogan was uh, very, President Erdogan of Turkey was very frequently, uh, in a sense, threatening that the floodgates to hell, as he called it, he would open and he would allow uh, refugees to to enter the European Union and, and would cause havoc. Now, for the first time in the history of the EU, the EU responded. Unlike in 2015, where the EU was pretty much surprised by what was happening and it didn't really do very much, what happened in this particular crisis in, was in February 2020, in fact, Erdogan again threatened to open the floodgates to hell like he has done since 2015 several times, but now he really started doing it. He opened, in fact, the borders and, and as more intelligence reports have come out, he didn't just open the borders to Europe. He, in fact, hired the buses, in a sense, beat some of the refugees from Istanbul to get on the bus, then he drove them to the border and then a lot of his agents used actual violence to make sure that the refugees would actually cross into, into Greece. Uh, there's also evidence of um, Turkish agents within the kind of refugee streams at the Greek border where they were actively taking part in terms of uh, trying to incite violence at the border. 
But the EU at that point responded in the sense that there were Frontex missions, there were border guard missions at the border trying to stop the flow from coming in. So what we saw was an increasing escalation at the border where both sides to an extent were using violence. And while some refugees managed to get over, on the other side they were greeted with some violence uh, by the Greek side, pushed back into Turkey, and, and then some of the Turkish buses brought them back to Istanbul after the events, after uh, President Erdogan managed to, um, in a sense, get another deal, managed to get more money from the European Union, which is partly what he wanted, but it wasn't the only thing that he wanted. Some of what he wanted also had something to do about European support in terms of the Turkish bargaining position in the Syria conflict. Um, so he managed to do that. Now, how does COVID-19 play into this? COVID-19 actually plays into this with a very, very dangerous kind of tint because there's already intelligence reports by various Western intelligence services that President Erdogan is planning to restart the, the threat at the border. And he's already been threatening that he's going to open the, the, the floodgates again. And intelligence services believe that as soon as the first lockdowns in various Turkish regions end, he's going to reassemble the buses and is going to bring the refugees at the border again only that this time, what we're doing is we're mixing health security with migration security. Because now the threat is not only that you're going to receive refugees, the threat is that you might receive refugees who may have been exposed to the virus and who are then going to, um, in a sense, bring that virus all over the shop. They're going to bring it to Greece, but going to help, um, in a sense, uh, increase the virus all over Europe where they might be traveling to. So intelligence services are already expecting that this is going to happen in the next couple of weeks. Um, and we see that, uh, in a sense, the virus is being used. Now, why do I think this is so dangerous? Well, we already know that there's a certain amount of um, external partners slash enemies of the European Union that are working in concert also with some internal enemies of the European Union inside the European Union. Here we have people like President Erdogan, who is pushing in this particular direction, notably in direction of Greece. Um, we have um, Hungarian Prime Minister um, Viktor Orban, who's already been uh, starting to spread rumors about migrants, um, in a sense, spreading the virus. And here we see the same scenario repeated as we see in, 19, uh, in, in 2016, 2015 and 16, where we had Russian hybrid warfare that was starting to spread the theory of refugees as terrorists. Because what we did in the book was kind of tracing back, well, where did the securitization of refugees and terrorists initially come from? And when we went to the bottom of that story, we found that that story came straight out of Moscow before it was ever spread anywhere inside the European Union. It was a story that was spun by Russia Today and by Sputnik News, came out at least six months prior to the actual crisis where they were already discussing refugees as possible terrorists. Then they were creating the situation on the ground in Syria where they were pushing the streams towards Turkey and were putting pressure on Turkey for those refugees to be spread into the European Union. And in order to then kind of cause the kind of instability inside the European Union and cause massive political problems also for various uh, European leaders. For instance, Angela Merkel probably never recovered from that kind of decision in terms of the refugee crisis. That was one of the reasons that her political career ended in, in a sense. So it hasn't fully ended yet, but it's on its, on its way there. So it created a massive kind of problem and, and you could already see how this was being constructed before the actual crisis. And in the same way you could do that in 2015, you can see that right now with COVID-19. With COVID-19, what you can see is already that Russian propaganda has been spreading this idea about refugees and migrants as spreader of the virus that's been spreading wild in various European countries. It's spreading very, very strongly uh, on, on, on far-right forums, on the internet, and in cybersecurity terms, and so on. So this threat 
as we speak, is being constructed. And in about a year's time, we are going to take it for granted because it's being constructed as we speak. And internal actors from within the European Union are going to accept it and are going to propagate it, just like it was with the refugee crisis initially in 2015, where we had outside actors like Russia initiating the securitization frame. You then had internal actors inside the European Union taking up the frame. Usually it was kind of far right actors within various European countries that were then initially responding, who are then propagating it. And then over time, this was picked up by more mainstream actors, even presidents and prime ministers such as Viktor Orban or the, 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 the prime minister of Poland at the time, or a number of them. And we see the same thing happening at the moment with COVID-19, where we see an outside frame being constructed in Moscow, pushed through by various far-right fora within the European Union, and they start to be, in a sense, taken up by some uh, mainstream politicians, if you like. Certainly, uh, Viktor Orban has taken on, on this topic about COVID-19 very strongly already. We see that also being taken on by the far right in Italy. Um, also, to kind of link that to, to what Kamala said earlier about that kind of how that links to the general propaganda warfare. And I, I, I used refugees as, as this example because people wouldn't expect hybrid warfare to happen on the refugee ground. But of course, the example of what China and Russia were initially doing was this kind of propaganda warfare where they were kind of showing themselves as this generous benefactor. And the story wasn't, as you probably know, that they sent all this equipment to Italy and then you had like the Russian tanks parading up and down from Rome, driving up to, to, to northern Italy and kind of parading Russian flags and kind of showing that they were bringing um, equipment. What you probably didn't realize is that the equipment that they brought um, was completely useless, useless for the actual uh, event. It was, had nothing to do with what the Italians needed. In fact, the Russians were not in possession with anything uh, of anything that the Italians needed. Um, the whole idea was that just that this was being used as a propaganda stint. But why did it work? Why did the world believe that the Russians actually helped the Italians? Well, it worked because one, we have two pro-Russian parties on the Italian scene. One, the Lega Nord, that is now a Lega, as it is in, in opposition now, it used to be in government, but it is now in opposition. Well, it's actually in government in Northern Italy. So those Italian regions that were asking for Russian helps were, were help were in fact regions that were governed by the Lega, by the far right in Italy. So they were asked by their own allies to provide help that nobody needed. Why was this in a sense, media opportunity granted? Well, because the part, the main party in power in Italy, which is the Cinque Stelle, the, the Five Star Movement, is another party that is very pro-Russian. Both parties very strongly influenced by, by Moscow. And, and, and as a result of that, being the willing outlet, they were not stupid in terms of what they were allowing there. This was a deliberate and an intentional act to kind of show Russia in this particular way. Why? Because it is necessary to show Russia in this particular way in order to turn the Italian public off the European Union. And for instance, German, uh, German military planes were flying in to Germany. Several Italian patients, like hundreds of Italian patients, were brought into Italy, were brought in by German military. This was not even mentioned on Italian TV. Why? Because it's not convenient for the current government that does not want to portray the European Union as a positive source for Italian security and that deliberately tries to construct Russia as, as a, in a sense, gener generous benefactor and, and so on. So I'll end on this note, but I think we have a lot of food for thought in terms of um, discussing the various topics. Uh, thanks a lot, Christian. That that was really great. That lots of kind of interesting insights. The things that we uh, are unlikely to hear on the news. Uh, that's what great research is about. Um, uh, Mike, uh, I can see that you are already uh, with us. Um, would you like to kind of briefly uh, maybe introduce yourself and you know 10, 15 minutes for your kind of initial uh, thoughts? Yeah, sure. Thank you very much, Kamel, Christian, and everybody else. It's very nice to um, be with you this afternoon. Um, 
obviously, as uh, as Christian mentioned earlier on, it would be so much nicer to see everybody in person and to share kind of um, your thoughts and feelings as a as a roundtable, but also in in conversation as well um, in person. So hopefully, we can do that. Uh, hope next year <laughs> with any luck. Um, but for now, um, so just building really on to what Camel has already mentioned and Christian um, for myself. Could, could you just briefly introduce yourself, Mike? Yes, sure. Sorry. Um, so I'm a senior lecturer and course leader um, at University of South Wales um, with a specific interest in counterterrorism, um, cyber security, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, so, in, res in relation, just really building on to um, what Camel and uh, Christian mentioned earlier on and how the COVID-19 um, has affected all of us really and perhaps um, looking inwardly to myself, probably from a digital response perspective, um, as well as the ex exponential security threats that have already been discussed, um, probably in the way that the world is actually communicating at the moment as we are, are today. Um, using the digital forums that we do more so than ever, things like Zoom, um, Teams, um, and the various other different platforms uh, is a really interesting kind of thought process as to how COVID-19 has, has, has not only allowed us to um, progress within the digital environment from, you know, from young people to professionals to, to older people to not only stay in contact with each other, but also with that comes the added security potential risk and threats that that digital environment um, supports and allows. Um, Camel mentioned earlier on the perceptions matter, um, both in terms of international relations and in a global distribution of soft power, and that can be seen absolutely in terms of the media um, and the wave of media around COVID-19 and the different countries' responses to that. Um, I think we've seen fairly recently in the in the news, and um, certainly in terms of um, death rates, for example, in the UK, uh, and how the death rates were initially reported uh, in terms of hospital death rates, and then the comparative analysis done um, across Europe and internationally around um, death rates as a result of COVID-19, and how the government initially um, wouldn't respond into uh, care homes. Um, and then as a result of some serious questions being put to government and government ministers around the briefing of um, on the daily briefings, then obviously care homes were brought into that as a result. And I think you, considering the impact and the influence that the media can have over people, both from a UK perspective and international perspective, could be seen potentially where those lines in relation to international relations, global distribution of soft power in particular, media can have an influence on those and particularly where perhaps um, the use of hybrid warfare can come in. So for me, um, what I really want to talk about to you today is how global leaders have invoked some war analogies to the current COVID-19 response and indeed how some organisations, state-sponsored um, and actual states as well from a, a state level, have used media um, in to, to desensitise and potentially normalise some of the threats that we see in everyday life. If you think of this from an advanced um, persistent threat perspective, and I'll, I'll come on to what that is um, in just a moment, um, we could consider that COVID-19 and the response to COVID-19 would sit firmly within the hands of an advanced persistent threat. So, <clears throat> We, by, by that, what I mean is if we, if we consider the Russian and Chinese influence operations, um, both within the UK, within the West, um, and how the Russian and potentially the Chinese have used their influence um, in terms of the COVID-19 response, as mentioned a little bit earlier on by Christian, um, how the news is filtered both from um, the Chinese ministry um, uh, and, and their media um, propaganda machine across into the UK and then across into the rest of the world and for once they were seen as being potentially the perpetrators and then all of a sudden they were coming out and being this almost the saviors of, um, of, 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 of the West in terms of their, their response. So what security threats do we see then from a digital perspective? Well we see the state level threats um, we see a media response to those state threat threats in some cases. We see the migration issues that Christian mentioned 
a little bit earlier on and, uh, and obviously the health threats that come with that as well potentially even um food you know if you cast your minds back um just a couple of weeks now and you try shopping in tesco's or asda's or aldi's or lidl's or any one of those other um supermarkets there was a real shortage in things like pasta and rice and, and there still are some cases now with flour and things like that so even food becomes a threat and when that becomes a threat then you know we we all feel it and i think with the um, the added influence that cyber the cyber domain can bring, certainly from a, a well orchestrated machine such as your Russian um, threat and the Russian influence operations in the West and in, into Europe, then potentially, you know, that can have a, a huge impact on us um, as a society, as a community, as as ordinary people, as both professional students um, and our friends and family alike. So what do these advanced persistent threats actually look like? Well, I suppose you can think of them in two different ways. Um, the first, uh, I suppose, the, the, the most obvious, unless there are computer scientists in, in, in the audience today, um, the, most, the, the, the most obvious in the way that I like to think of advanced persistent threats would be old school illegal spying, then, shall we say, the type of, um, the, the type of spy that allows themselves to infiltrate um, a state, an organization, a company, whatever that might be, um, undetected, unknown, and be able to pass information back to wh whichever controlling organization that responds to them so that they can have an influence on what actually takes place in the host country. And that's where we're, that's, that's my interest level here at the moment is what advanced, what if you take the threats that were mentioned a little bit earlier on, particularly around um, Russia, China, um, Iran, some of the some of the other countries that have been uh, discussed today, and some of the issues that have already mentioned been mentioned today, particularly around migration, refugee uh, the refugee issues that Christian mentioned, um, and some of the things that Russia has already been um, highlighted as been doing, so, such as uh, the Russia Today media articles, the Sputnik News migration issues. Uh, and the creation of instability within countries, how then does that advanced persistent threat, both from a real world, um, in terms of those illegal spy networks that are already in place within um, Western societies, um, and no, more now, more and more now, um, the digital threats that are being posed in terms of um, advanced persistent threats across different social, network, social media networking sites and within um, different organizations, how can they all act in unison to to increase the threats to um, the West? And how can COVID-19 be um, used as a catalyst or certainly a supporting element to be able to allow that to take place? So in terms of um, in terms of threat analogy, if we can go on to that for one moment, um, an advanced persistent threat is 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 a sophisticated um, and a sustained cyber attack method which can be used and um, which has been seen on on a number of times over over the course of the years probably the most or one of the one of the more um uh, famous or inf yeah one of the more famous ones would would have been um the iranian nuclear site um some years ago but however th this is a constant issue that we need to be mindful of and, and it's not just coming from a, it wouldn't just be coming from a state perspective either. Um, when we talk about war analogies and how um, countries can use the uh, COVID-19 war analogy response to their public security messaging, then what we need to think about there is the potential influence on uh, criminality, on the desensitization of the general public to what we now perceive to be um, threats to us, the normalization of those threats and how those norm how, how the normalization of those threats may, may affect public sentiment. When we link these threats to the general propaganda of warfare and the potential influence of radicalization or the increase in criminology from both pro-state or terrorist purposes, then we can see then the, the real potential around hybrid warfare and the advanced persistent threat issues that we might face 
particularly when thinking of the digital arena around state level, media migration, health, um, and from that cyber domain. Kamil, is it okay if I leave it there for now and take some questions as we go through? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, Mike. Thanks. Thank uh, you. Thanks a lot for your insights. And um, and we already have uh, a number of questions. Uh, if you want to ask a question, please either post it in this uh, chat section of the meeting, or just you know mention in the chat that you would like to kind of speak to your microphone. That's also fine. I'll then uh, kind of invite you to do that. There is already a number of questions. Uh, I guess I'll just very quickly. Uh, maybe respond to to a couple, give you my uh, quick perspective. So one question is, are we expecting uh, a more bipolar world after COVID-19 uh, world run by China and the United States? Uh, my answer is no. Uh, it, we should probably not expect kind of substantial kind of differences in, in, in the distribution of kind of military or economic power. Uh, what we talk about here is this kind of war of of perceptions, the kind of softer dimension of power, perhaps who is being seen as a leader, uh, who is being seen as a committed kind of responder to this to this pandemic, who is being seen as as, a, as an actor whose response go beyond the boundaries of its own state, right? Who who wants to commit to help others, right? So that's that's the kind of uh, as Christian said, propaganda warfare that is being waged at the moment. I don't expect any substantial. Kind of, you know, if we adopt this kind of neo-realist language, I don't expect any substantial differences there. There, one other question that I think I wanted to quickly uh, maybe comment on: in terms of environmental security, we can see that COVID-19 has actually had a positive impact on the environment. Do you think that when the lockdown restrictions are lifted, the international community will continue to protect the environment? Well, um, that's a good question. Uh, on 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 Twitter, I actually follow some some conservative commentators uh, from the United States. And it's interesting how they seem to freak out and at, at, at the notion that um, that we will be coming out uh, of this kind of current pandemic as a different society. Um, they seem to be very anxious that um, that we um, they seem to make an argument that the kind of social contract that we have at the moment is that we are in this crisis and 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 we agree on this kind of curbing of freedoms, but we come out of this and we don't make any kind of changes to how our societies are run, you know, the kind of issues of climate change, environmental protection, because that's some, that's not that's not the agreement, that's not part of the pact, right? Uh, we have to come out. And if you know if there is anything else we want to then kind of change or discuss, that's open for debate. But we should not, you know, sneak in kind of our own kind of liberal agendas, right? L like protecting the environment, right? So or fighting climate change. So it's so it's interesting. But I, I I don't, you know, I on a kind of more pragmatic level, I think a lot of the things will go back to business as usual. Um, I guess those are my two quick reactions. Uh, uh, Christian and Mike, you can see some of the other kind of questions there if you want to pick any of those. Uh, I have to uh, ask me those questions because when I click on the chat, it doesn't come up, so I actually can't read them. I don't know why. Oh, you don't see you don't see anything. Uh, Mike, do you see uh, do you see questions in the if you I go to I have to be part of the University of Southampton to see them because no. students can't see them. Yeah. OK, OK, uh, I, I'll read some of the questions uh, for you then and, and see if you want to react to to any of those. Uh, I think that these are all kind of interesting questions. So one is, um, um, do you think the accession of the Western Balkan states to the EU is a realistic target? Does the EU have a responsi responsibility to do more to make reforms happen? Or does failure to reform lie with the Western Balkan states? So that's the kind of that's the question of EU enlargement to to, to Western Balkans. Uh, I think Christian, you've been kind of looking into yeah. some of that now. Yeah, I don't know, but I, I can give you my, my thoughts. Yeah. About it. Um, I think it's a difficult question. I mean, the way the question is phrased is kind of, is it realistic? As in, can in the Western Balkans? Uh, ever get to those standards. I think the way you could also phrase that question is, is it realistic to leave them outside the framework of the European Union? And that would be suggesting that we have a launching path for both 
Russia and Turkey inside the European continent, from which they can then influence developments in neighboring countries that are members of the European Union. And I think that is not a very realistic prospect. I think um, there may be many problems associated to them, and I don't expect that they are going to reach um, European Union standards, though they seem to be falling, it seems. But even those falling standards are probably not going to be reached very, very soon. But uh, I think it's a not, a not a realistic prospect to leave them outside the European Union, especially, you know, in a sense, NATO membership and Euro, EU membership tends to go hand in hand a little bit. There's exceptions, of course, but, but in terms of integration of Eastern Europe into the Western arena, those two things tend to go hand in hand. And I think some of them, like Northern Macedonia, has just recently joined uh, NATO. So we're going to have to expect that those countries are going to join the European Union eventually. There's a little bit of a precedence there. I mean, all of the countries that joined the European Union eventually joined NATO uh, before they joined the European Union, sometimes by a couple of years. So I think we can expect something similar here. Wow. Well, thank you. Thank you, Christian. I'll just read you the, the other three questions that, that we have. And, uh, you know, you can, uh, you know, Mike and Christian, you can both kind of answer whichever you, you like, if you like to answer any of those. So one is how deep and how far this situation will affect Europe as, as a continent economically and from security perspective? That's one question. The other one is are we expecting other powers to rise at the end of this crisis, like Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Russia, for instance? Um, do you think that social? Do you think that when social distancing restrictions are lifted, there will be a spike in terrorism and other types of crime as people are allowed to interact with others more? Uh, so, if you want to kind of tackle any of those questions, feel free. Yeah. Um. I don't know. Do you want one mic, and then I'll go again? Okay. If I go for the um, the uh, one regarding terrorism, um, do I think that there will be uh, an increase in terrorism and crime when social distancing restrictions are lifted? Um, yes, I do. Um, Christian, what do you think of that? Do you think that's? Yeah, I think so as well. I think, especially on the far right, we're seeing such huge movements there. In, in Germany is a bit ahead of the curve in the UK, but this is happening in the UK soon as well. In Germany, we see a radicalization of the anti-COVID-19 movement as we speak. We see massive demonstrations. We can expect that there's possibly foreign agent provocateur amongst those people as well. Possibly some foreign fighters who have come back either from Syria or from Ukraine. Um, I think as soon as things are lifted, we're going to see a further radicalization of that kind of movement, the anti-COVID-19 movement, and uh, we're going to see that leading to, to increasing far-right activity. And we've seen that also, I'm talking about only far-right, but in fact, we've seen that some of the anti-COVID-19 movement is also on the far-left. So there is uh, we might expect uh, both uh, both dimensions to be rising but i think it's without a doubt that with the economic crisis that is going to hit us with everything that's going to hit us i think that is all going to feed into this sense of uh, unhappiness with different elements pushing for it i think so I, I i would agree completely and just to just to build on that christian thank you um in terms of criminality as well i can see you know with the economic crisis that's going to happen um, and the restriction of border controls as well at the moment. I think that um, everybody uh, is being watched and they, they, they're aware of that. But as soon as restrictions are starting to lift and people can come together again, there will be the opportunities that don't exist at the moment for people to move between each other. Um, so it's not just from a radicalization and, and, uh, and terrorism perspective, but also from an organized crime perspective as in people being moved to different locations as well. So not just from a commodity perspective, but also potentially getting back to business as usual around things like human trafficking and the movement of antiquities, finance and things like that, unfortunately. Thank you, Mike. Um, so one question that I, I, you know, I will kind of start with and, and you are free to join in because it directly relates to kind of my work that I, the article that I kind of published uh, well, not published, submitted recently, uh, <laughs> far for, from publishing. Uh, does a geopolitical European Commission entail direct competition with China and Russia? And how would it compete with them, especially in the face of propaganda and hybrid warfare? So 
this notion of geopolitical European Commission in in case you don't know the new um, the new president of the European Commission Commission um, uh, Ursula von der Leyen the former German uh, defense minister she announced that the, the the European Commission must become more geopolitical and and this is a it's easy to kind of overcome. It's 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 easy to kind of miss that. It's in in all the noise. But from the the IR international relations perspective, this is unprecedented. This is kind of highly significant that a non-state kind of transnational bureaucracy announces that it, it would like to pursue a more geopolitical agenda, right? So j- j- just this kind of just this label, this announcement, the narrative, the the the. Is is quite unprecedented and quite remarkable. Um, it was not at, at the time last year when it was kind of phrased that way, but um, uh, we are yet to see how it will materialize. So, so what does it mean, the geopolitical European Commission? Well, based on 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 the actual actions of the new European Commission and how that how that principle has been kind of implemented to date, it essentially means. Uh, placing more emphasis on the EU's kind of foreign policy and taking the foreign policy dimension of all Commission activities much more seriously. It's also giving, it's also about uh, giving more prominence to the uh, the new High Representative for Common Foreign and Security Policy, uh, Josep Borrell, giving him much more kind of input into into the European Commission. Um, the question is: Is it going to work? Is it going? To, is it? Is this agenda going to to work? Um, I'm skeptical because um, I I I don't I don't see how EU member states would all EU member states would would want to see a much more active European Commission in the kind of field of foreign and security policy. That's something, that's that's an area that traditionally the European Commission has been excluded. Now, has the European Commission been involved in international security? That's a totally different question. And my PhD, my whole PhD was about arguing that, yes, it, it has been involved in international security, but the question of kind of the geopolitical kind of language is, is, is different altogether. And... And 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 I I I am quite skeptical uh, how how far it will go. Um, the other question is should should it go? Should the European Commission be, become more geopolitical? And my argument in 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 the article that I that I submitted recently is that it should be careful. Um, that it probably it probably shouldn't, uh, because the European Commission has developed as a unique actor in international security with a unique set of instruments that has been received with a kind of relatively high degree of credibility by external actors because the European Commission has not traditionally been perceived as an actor that has a hidden hidden geopolitical agenda, but rather as a kind of an actor focused on human security, on kind of linking development assistance with security in contrast to 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 the council of, of ministers and this framework of eu common foreign and security policy which is very much kind of intended to be geopolitical and driven by 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 kind of high politics considerations the european commission went kind of under the radar over the decades advancing its kind of security uh, agenda, international security agenda. Uh, it's been quite successful in what it has been kind of doing, but now kind of turning to 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 geopolitics, it 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 may not serve it very well. That that's that's my argument. Uh, Christian or Mike, would you like to comment on that as well, or should we move to the next one? Yeah, I can I can say a couple yeah. of words. I think. On, on both of those things that you said, I probably share your skepticism. I, I share the skepticism that the European Commission has the capability of becoming more geopolitical. I share the skepticism of whether it is wise. But I would say one thing, um, the European Commission and the European Union is being treated already in a geopolitical way. So when we're talking about hybrid warfare, we're talking about Russia, we're talking about the Turks, we're talking about elements of Trump, like Bannon's movement, um, 
they're already treating them in a geopolitical way. And why? Because they're seeing them as a geopolitical rival. Now, the weakening of the European Union has something to do with treating them as a geopolitical rival. So they're already being treated in a geopolitical way. Now, uh, can they? I think on the capabilities front, I'm very skeptical that they have the instruments to really fight back. Um, now, some of the instruments that you need for geopolitics are instruments that they simply don't have. I mean, just starting from the point of view, what I was saying earlier about, you know, intelligence, it's a little bit on the flimsy side inside the European Commission in terms of just knowing what's happening, right? I mean, obviously the European External Action Service is being built and they're getting more and more intelligence capabilities. But, you know, we're nowhere near where, you know, national intelligence services are, not, not even close to that. So on that front, I think they're, they're seriously lagging behind. And then also, I think the next problem is, of course, that Europe itself is divided on a lot of those issues. Um, you know, as I was just saying, I mean, Germany has clearly become one favorite target for, for the Russians. It's very obvious that Germany is one of their main um, in a sense, grounds for hybrid warfare, just as the United Kingdom is, but the United Kingdom for other reasons. Um, but Italy is, for instance, inviting um, some of the Russian activity there. They're actively, the government is not against some of those activities. So um, we have uh, the former Austrian um, foreign minister. I don't know whether you saw those news. Do you remember the one that used to dance with Vladimir Putin on her wedding? Yes, I actually I actually saw that I, I was doing some kind of research and I and I came across that image a couple of days ago. Yes, yes. remarkable. She's 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 now officially on the payroll of Russia today. So Oh yes, that's why I that's why I, I, I found that image because it, it, it was attached to that news exactly. Yes. Yes. So as long as you have those kind of actors inside the European Union, she would have been going to those council meetings, right? She would have seen all the kind of discussions that they're having. So how on earth are you going to have a geopolitical strategy towards Russia with those people sitting around the table? It's a little bit difficult. Uh, I think Gerhard Schroeder has reactivated himself recently again, kind of making some some comments. Uh, I, he does on a regular basis, but but... The interesting thing about Gerhard Schröder is that, like everybody knows, he's the PR spokesman for Vladimir Putin. He's not hiding it at all. Everybody's aware that he's so closely linked to the Russian regime as you possibly can be. But the fact that somebody like him is around gives cover to lots and lots of other politicians who are not so open about it, but who are also in the take and who are also in terms of um, helping certain interests. And, and in that sense, he's actually quite useful for a number of people because they can say, oh, well, you know, there's Gerhard Schröder and he does far more than I do. So, you know, um, but like I said, having those people around the table is going to make it very, very difficult. I mean, like I said, towards Russia, but let's talk about China, right? When we have the, the Italians again and, and, and various European countries kind of openly inviting the Chinese for their kind of silk projects and others kind of saying, hang on, we need to be a little bit careful because they're kind of um, buying our infrastructure here or that kind of stuff in terms of. So to be able to really be that geopolitical Europe would kind of assume to an extent that we have a certain minimum level of understanding of what our geopolitical threats are. But at this point, there's a, you know, there's a huge array of difference in terms of the perception of what those threats are. Some people perceive certain actors as threats, while others are seeing them as allies. Um, as opportunities, yeah. Mike, did you want to uh, say something or, or just skipping this one? No, no, I'm just, um, I'm just thinking, you know, in terms of, uh, in terms of what both yourself and Christian have just said, I completely agree with, with what you said. And it's a very, um, should we say, a very murky world in terms of um, who are your friends, who are your allies, and who kind of like flits between the two. Um, and again, you know, going back to what I was, my, my, my first initial um, opening around advanced persistent threats. If you take the advanced side off it and you take the cyber side off it, you're still dealing with humans, and you're still dealing with that um, that that ability to be able to move between as a human being, be able to move between 
um, an influence, whether it be geopolitically um, on, or, or from a media perspective. So I think we just need to be very mindful around that in terms of how we go forwards um, into the future. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Uh, so here is this next question. Will the COVID-19 elite countries to, to coexist in sort of a more separated world, uh, focusing more on the own national security, national assets, etc., or on the contrary, our society will become even more interconnected because this particular crisis will highlight, highlight the existing deficiencies and gaps in international cooperation uh, and shared efforts. Oh, that's, that's an easy one. Yes, indeed. <laughs> I can give my sense if you want. Please uh, do. I think, well, there's obviously two ways of looking at it. One is that the lack of cooperation is going to lead to more cooperation. The other one is the lack of cooperation is going to show us that this is actually quite good. Um, I think it's very difficult to say for sure, but I think it's unlikely that we're going to see increased cooperation. I think we're going to see cooperation as we've had uh, to an extent. Uh, I think globalization has gone quite far and I think to an extent it will be rolled back because one of the things that we saw within the crisis, like what we were discussing there in terms of uh, security of supplies, security, food security, like medical supplies and so on, I think governments in the future are going to think whether there's a security dimension to production. I think the crisis has already kind of shown that. So governments in the future are not going to want to be caught out again, that they need something and they just can't get it because China or Turkey won't deliver it. I think there will be a thinking that certain production has to be at home. So when we have a pandemic, when we have a massive crisis, we're actually able to bring it to the people. So I think this invariably means there's going to be some sort of rolling back of globalization. I don't think we're going to go the other way where we're going to say, oh, we're going to all become autark regimes where we're just going to do ourselves, our own production about everything. I think that's not possible. Our, uh, well, European countries for a start are too small. They don't have enough um, enough resources to be really doing things like that. And also, I think the kind of wealth uh, losses that you would incur would be far too high. But I think there's going to be a new thinking in terms of what element of the economy needs to be thought of as a security issue rather than just a business opportunity. And I think that's going to happen because I think national governments are not going to be one to caught out again, as a lot of them were. And uh, so there, there needs to be some rethinking. Yeah. Thanks, Christine. Uh, Mike, did you want to add anything uh, to that? Um, I, 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 I agree, uh, Christian. I, I, that, that's, that's my thinking exactly. So, so there will be, there will be cooperation as it, uh, as, as it was. I mean, there will be no drastic uh, reversal of, of, of globalization, but there will be some recognition that certain sectors, uh, certain su supplies need to be protected. I don't want to say nationalized, but essentially kind of making sure that there is this national capacity. And uh, so that's the kind of, the, I guess that's 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 the more pragmatic dimension of this, but there is also this more symbolic dimension, which I think will be interesting how, uh, how the narrative around sovereignty will be constructed and kind of reconstructed in the coming years, how different political parties will try to to hijack that 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 or or to construct that narrative and and try to explain kind of convincingly um, the story of sovereignty and 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 globalization and and uh, perhaps in a sense a little bit similarly to this earlier kind of discussion you you Christian kind of shared with us on 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 asylum seekers and and refugees and. And how that discourse was created, and that then it took you know months and years to really settle in, and 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 may perhaps even become taken for granted uh, in 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 a way. And and I wonder that kind of more symbolic dimension, because you know if if you are on Twitter, if you are on social media, you can already see the battle kind of of narratives and ideas about the very notion of globalization and sovereignty, right? So. 
So uh, I would say a new chapter of cultural wars uh, is upon us. It's 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 only just beginning. I would One say. thing yeah. that I wanted to say about the term sovereignty, I find the discussions about sovereignty very interesting. <laughs> Because sovereignty is a term straight out of the Communist Party's playbook. If you are a little bit familiar with their kind of socialist terminology, and, and usually uh, if you look at people like Maduro in, in Venezuela, if you look at certain African dictators, sovereignty is always a shorthand for I decide. And uh, in a sense, it's, a, it's an anti-democratic word, the way it's been used by certain actors. And, and, and it is very, very... Um, obviously, the Chinese are extremely strong about that idea of sovereignty, but of course, sovereignty means something very, very different for them. So I think it's it's very interesting to hear how this is something that is penetrating our Western discourse, because in in the West, sovereignty was seen as something a little bit different. But I have the impression with all that hybrid warfare, terms are starting to change their meaning a little bit as well. Possibly, possibly. Um, how do you predict European-Chinese relations moving forward, with many in Europe calling for the Communist Party, Chinese Communist Party, to be held to account for COVID-19? Will mass Chinese investment in Europe, uh, like Belt and Road Initiative, affect uh, our response? Uh, an interesting question, especially in the context of the recent, well, shall we say, little diplomatic scandal uh, with the European Union's kind of publication in, in, in Chinese media. Would, would, would anyone like to start kind of with some thoughts on this? That's a difficult question, right? Um, yeah. is, is, the, is, is the European, I would say, is the European Union kind of allowing China to um, to kind of take over maybe and lead the narrative. Uh, so the recent kind of the recent controversy was that the European Union uh, was about to publish um, uh, in, in, in a Chinese kind of uh, outlet um, an, an article. Um, it, it was it was um, I mean, I, as far as I kind of read it, it was relating to this kind of the Chinese kind of building Chinese European celebrating European Chinese kind of partnership, but China disagreed. China refused to insert the part where it said that the coronavirus originated in China, right? So and and then and then the EU kind of uh, representative, the EU ambassador, agreed on that, right? So so that that that's one kind of indication, or for many that would that was an indication that actually the EU is very soft on China. Uh, should it become harder on China? Should it ho ho hold China to account? Mm -hmm. What What does the student think? What does the student think uh, whether China should be held to account? Okay, well, who has that question? Uh, feel free to to share your thoughts. Uh, who was it? I don't I don't see the first names here. Um, so yeah, feel free to share your thoughts if, if, the if you want. Please speak now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that would be. I, I would like to, you know, I would like to invite you to to share your thoughts. Um, do you have a microphone? No. No. Well, is 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 there? Ah, no microphone. Okay, that's all right. Uh, is there any other student who would like to kind of share? Thoughts on, on 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 this question: Should should Europe be tougher on China? Should it uh, hold China to account? Uh, so feel free you know, if there is anyone who would like to share thoughts, please do. Yeah, you can just you can just unmute your microphone and, and speak up. No, that's all right. You can you can join it. Uh, okay, I think Europe should. Someone says okay. <laughs> well, so that, well that so that's that's an argument uh, that is currently being kind of discussed in 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 European kind of in, among people interested in European diplomatic 
kind of foreign policy and and EU external relations. Um, how tough the EU should be on China and this re- recent controversy that I mentioned has kind of, in the eyes of many, it has indicated that Europe is not capable of being sufficiently tough, uh, and it allowed itself to kind of censor the narrative, right? So that's yeah, that's that's an argument. I think the difficulty is a little bit that again. Um, European countries don't share the same threat perception of China. Um, some countries have been going in the direction where they're kind of saying, well, yes, China has clearly caused an issue here. Um, but even that is, in a sense, debated. We have the range from, you know, China caused it to China delayed it to, well, what exactly did China do? We don't know exactly what 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 they did. And the Chinese obviously say we've done nothing. Um, then that's kind of coupled with, uh, you know, the Italians who now think of the Chinese as massive benefactors um, to to various European countries that are hoping to benefit. I mean, um, when uh, and I think I was in Belgrade, I recently saw that the Chinese uh, were were visiting to bring over some kind of material against the the virus and and all of that kind of stuff you know they were basically treated like a like a triumph arriving there in Belgrade and you had all sorts of uh, placards up for the Chinese they're so wonderful thank you and what what the what the Serbians didn't uh, say is that the European Union actually paid for the flight. Uh, so so that flight where the Chinese were then kind of using as a propaganda opportunity. So in a sense, you could argue, well, maybe they should already start becoming a little bit more clued up when they're being used. And um, one example is that, you know, China was making such a big deal about, you know, we're bringing equipment to Europe, what they didn't mention was that in December, when the epicenter was really on China, Europe was sending them a lot of material in terms of medical equipment and so on. But you know, the Chinese at the time said, you know, we'll take it, but can you not advertise this? Um, Because they didn't like it in terms of the discourse that it produced. So the Europeans said, yes, that's fine. All we care about is that you have it. So Europeans kind of sent it over and and then the Chinese managed to invert the discourse where now suddenly it's the Chinese that are helping all the Europeans. When in fact, what the Chinese were providing to all of the European countries put together was only a fraction of what they received in December. So um, the Europeans are not very clever at that game. Um, So... Um, a quick follow-up question, Christian, uh, directed uh, to you, and, and it relates to what you just kind of said. And th- it's a long question, but I will summarize it uh, in, in, in one or two sentences. So the question is, you know, the fact that German uh, assistance to Italy wasn't advertised as much as the Russian assistance, does it have to do with the fact that we take the kind of inter-EU, the kind of internal EU response for granted and and we would expect germany and other countries to help each other and uh we perhaps give much more um uh, emphasis and prominence to russia's response because it came unexpected we would not expect russia to get involved in this way because it it shares no obligations and responsibilities in 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 this regard so was it simply because it was just more interesting from the kind of journalistic media perspective, kind of a sexier, perhaps, you know, topic, you know, oh, Germany help Italy, you know, oh, that's not very interesting, but oh, Russia, you know, it's it's a bit of a question of, you know, if, if the dog bites a person, that's not a news, but if a person bites the dog, you know, that's news, right? So, so maybe, maybe it has to do with that as well. It partially probably does, but I think it goes beyond that because if that were true you would say okay then we should not find any evidence that italian governmental structures instructed uh, the media not to mention other european countries but we have found evidence we have found evidence from both the regional government and the national government in italy that instructed the media not to mention 
Uh, the, so this was, uh, yes, it's partially true, but it's also part of a deliberate attempt to, to downplay this because it fits their own political narrative. Because the prime minister in Italy is part of a, or is linked to a pro-Russian, pro-Chinese party. And of course, the regional government in northern Italy, where the epicenter of the crisis was, is entirely governed by the Lega, which is also a pro-Russian government. So we have really there a conflation of, of different occurrences. Because, for instance, this happened in Italy. But why did we not see the same thing in Spain? Do you think the Russians wouldn't have tried with the Spanish? Of course they would have tried, but the Spanish government didn't want it. Because the Spanish government asked them, what, are you, what do you have to offer? And then they said, oh, well, we have this and that. And the Spanish government said, yeah, but we don't need that. You know, so uh, it's why have the images become so popular only about Italy and not about Spain, even though the crisis was as bad in Spain as it was in Italy? Well, that's because the government in Italy wanted it and the government in Spain didn't. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for, for that. Um, one question is about Hungary. Uh, what would the likely EU response to uh, be to Hungary's Prime Minister Viktor Orban if he refuses to expire the so-called Authorization Act, granting him additional power at the end of COVID-19 crisis? So will the EU this time be tough? Right? Uh, Viktor Orban um, uh, assumed some kind of additional special powers, mm -hmm. which essentially make it impossible to call Hungary a democracy anymore, at least a liberal. I don't know. I know I always struggle with this distinction between democracy and, and liberal democracy, right? <laughs> Is illiberal democracy a democracy? Um, but but he did assume additional powers if if it was at all possible. Uh, so will the EU be tougher this time if he refuses to expire them in the end? Yes, I mean, the answer is very clearly no. The EU is not going to be tougher. And in fact, I think there's a big risk that if the EU tries to be tougher, that he can play them. And one thing that you've probably heard recently is the, did you all hear about the verdict of the German Constitutional Court with regards to the, um, to the kind of um, bond purchase of the European Central Bank? Now, it sounds a little bit boring because it's about bonds and about purchasing and money, liquidity and all of that. But the verdict is very, very dangerous and actually is going to be a massive, massive boon to, to, to Viktor Orban or possibly also to the current Polish government. Um, because basically the verdict said that the German Constitutional Court does not recognize the verdict of the European Court of Justice that very clearly said that the, the actions of the European Central Bank were legal and it says that it doesn't recognize that verdict because it calls the European Court of Justice um, decision arbitrary. Now, under the treaties, the German Constitutional Court does not have the legal authority to even make a judgment over the European Court of Justice. So it clearly went outside its own powers to even make that call. But what it now means is that we have a precedence, a legal precedence, where national constitutional courts can say, whatever you've decided in Brussels and in Strasbourg goes against our own national constitution, irrespective of the fact that we have legal obligations, but we just kind of ignore those legal obligations. We say they go against the national constitution and we're going to decide what happens. Now, if you apply that to the Hungarian situation, the Hungarian Prime Minister is in full control over the Hungarian Constitutional Court. The Hungarian Constitutional Court is going to say whatever Viktor Orban wants it to say. So the Hungarian Constitutional Court can now use that verdict by the German Constitutional Court and say to the European Union, but out, you have nothing to say in our jurisdictions, we decide what happens here in Hungary. And frankly, we don't care what EU legislation comes with it. So the only mechanism that the European Union then has is to expel Hungary. That's about the only thing that they can do. And for that, well, actually not expel Hungary, it's to, to remove their voting power. That's the only mechanism that they have. And um, for that, they need unanimity. Well, the current 
the current government in Warsaw has made it very clear that they're not going to allow for any such action against Hungary. And you would probably find other governments in the region that might support that, whether that could be the Czech government, whether it could be the Slovak government. Uh, so there's a couple of governments that are going to protect Viktor Orban, which leaves us with legally no options to actually um, do anything whatsoever against Hungary except taking them to the European Court of Justice, which they might ignore, taking them to the European Court of Human Rights, which they might ignore. And I may say so, um, Russia is still part of the European Court of Human Rights, you know, even though there were many, many verdicts against Russia. And then they boycotted the European Court of Human Rights for a little while. And then they said, you know what? If you're willing to pay again, we're going to take you in again. So Russia is now a fully functioning member. And I think the same game is going to happen with Hungary, possibly with Poland when it comes down, down to it. Those governments are not going to voluntarily leave the European Union because they're benefiting too much from the European Union. But at the same time, they're going to re-establish what it means to be a member of the European Union in such a way that we won't recognize the European Union as we know it. Thank you, Christian. Thank you. Um, right. Uh, any other any other questions? Do we have any other questions? That's been Sorry, yeah, Mike. Just, did um did the student come back with a response after today? Uh, let me see. Down? Uh, while I believe we should hold them accountable, uh, I can't see many nations openly, criti openly criticizing China due to the economic links with numerous European nations. Uh, and 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 here is an example of Britain and 5G network. Uh, on the horizon and uh, Chinese offering to fund uh, kind of different initiatives. Um, so, uh, so, 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 I, 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 I kind of, kind of agree here. In, in, in Britain, there seems to be this kind of narrative of, you know, uh, other than the the, the COVID nineteen, Britain kind of being open for business, right? Britain is open for business. Uh, and it, and I think it, I think the pressure on on the British government to prove that Brexit can work uh, is too strong, and 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 there is just there is just not going to be a a credible um, argument for holding Russia too strongly kind of to account, right? So that's it's that's, probably that's, true, but I might add that even though the British government is in a much, much weaker position than it was, it still provides for a slightly more robust response than we see from some other European powers. <laughs> That's also true. That's also true. Yeah. It's, it's, it would be difficult to, 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 to argue that the EU is a, is a kind of you know, unitary actor here um, in international relations. Uh, but when, wh whenever, whenever we say, and and there is there is a very valid criticism of the EU to be had, but one criticism that that often gets kind of raised already from the nineteen early nineteen nineties and, and even earlier, that the EU cannot be um, an an international security actor because it lacks coherency, it's it's unable to speak as one, right? What's the Europe's phone number, etc. Well, you know, let's look at some of the state actors, right? Let's look at the United States, right? Is the United States a coherent international security actor, right? So we have to be careful not to raise the bar too high and and just take for granted that states are those kind of famous billiard balls, kind of kind of neorealist kind of billiard balls, kind of unitary, coherent, self-contained actors. They are anything but. Uh, so let's not raise bar yes. too high, I would say. Does the U.S. president even agree with his own generals or with his own yeah. intelligence services? Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, well, um, 
if there are no further questions, you know, I think we can we can conclude uh, the, the, the meeting. Uh, well, thank you, thank you, Christian, and thank you, Mike, for joining us. Uh, it turned out so much better than I expected, uh, you know, because again, ideally we would meet uh, on campus uh, in Southampton, uh, but I think this was this was great, and I really enjoyed, um, you know, having you and having all those questions and having you engage with those questions. Uh, hopefully, in the future, we can, you know, have you uh, maybe here on campus. Uh, thanks a lot. Perfect. Thank you very much. And thank you to the students uh, for coming, for participating. Um, I will circulate the link to uh, to the meeting. Uh, well, thank you very much. So that's that's that. <laughs> thank thanks a lot. Cheers. Thank you.